I'm Marion Brooks, Vice President and U.S. Country Head of Diversity and Inclusion at Novartis, where we are committed to reimagining medicine for all people. It is critically important for us all to really address the historical disparities in healthcare if we want to have true health equity. One of the things that Novartis is doing to show our commitment to health equity is our Beacon of Hope initiative, where we have partnered with 26 historically black colleges and medical schools to establish centers of excellence to address diversity in clinical trials, climate change, and removing racial bias from the tests and standards that are used in the medical field. It's a $33 million 10 year commitment that we've made, but we go beyond just the centers of excellence at the four medical schools. We are also providing scholarships, internships, as well as mentorship to the students at the HBCUs over these next 10 years. This is just one of the big initiatives that we have here at Novartis, where we are doing our part to address this challenge that we all see and we're all facing. There are many more opportunities that we are looking at here at Novartis, and you'll hear more about what we're doing in the space of cardiovascular health later in the summer. I wanna thank the CBCF for holding this important summit. And I want to thank all of you for being here and for attending, because the only way we get through this is together. And when we bring all of our minds together, the private as well as the public sector, that is how true change will happen. Thank you again for the opportunity to open up the summit, and I wish you all a great day. Good morning and welcome to our 2022 Policy for the People Health Equity Virtual Summit. I am so honored to be here with more than 1,000 people today, including health professionals, policymakers, community advocates, and those who are closest to the issues being discussed today so that we can have a wonderful conversation about equitable health resources in maternal care and work to address chronic illness issues impacting Black communities. Before we take a deep dive into today's discussion and our first session on Black maternal health in the U.S. and abroad, I'd like to take a few minutes to talk to you about the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, who we are and what we do. The CBCF was founded in 1976, and it was established by 13 members of the 92nd United States Congress, and it was founded to be a public policy, education, and research institute committed to improving the socioeconomic circumstances for all African-Americans and underserved communities. So here's what we do. We develop leaders, we inform the global community on policy, and we educate the public by bringing together subject matter experts, like those we're bringing together today, 
industry leaders, elected officials, students, and concerned citizens so that we can engage in meaningful conversations that will help to incite positive change and empower the global Black community. We also work to develop leaders through our Leadership Institute. Each semester, we recruit, train, and provide opportunities to college students and recent graduates worldwide so that they have the opportunity to work on Capitol Hill, in federal agencies, and in well-respected corporations. At CBCF, we believe that no matter where you come from, what your background or socioeconomic situation, you should not be deprived of the opportunity to grow and develop your skills to be a policy professional. And that's what our internship programs in Washington, D.C. provide for everyone. It's essential, we think, to learn about and grow new leaders now and to think about how we are preparing them for the future. So we are committed to training them and getting them engaged and interested in politics. That's what our Leadership Institute does. We also have a National Racial Equity Initiative and Center for Policy Analysis and Research, which works on our education and informing the public part of our mission. They've recently published four timely reports that I think it's worth mentioning. First, the Black Dollar, Cooperative Economics in Africa, Reproductive Rights, Dobbs versus Jackson and Implications for the Black Maternal Health Crisis, The Unintended Consequences of Algorithmic Bias, Reparations, More Than 150 Years Later, The Case for Restorative Justice Policy in Evanston, Illinois, and finally, Appeal for Administrative Action, Canceling Student Loan Debt for Historically Black College and University Alumni. So as you can see, our Policy and Research Institute focuses on a myriad number of issues, again, to help inform and educate the public. Now, I would like to move on to introduce Representative Terry Sewell, who is the chairperson of the Congressional Black, Black Caucus Foundation Board. But before I do, I would like to give a huge thank you to Congresswoman Joyce Beatty, who is the chairperson of the Congressional Black Caucus, who unfortunately is not able to join us today, but who is with us in spirit and asked me to send her greetings and let you all know how important she thinks today's discussion is and how very excited she is that we are all gathered to engage. Now, Congresswoman Terry, Terry Sewell really needs no introduction. She is a proud representative of Alabama's 7th Congressional District, one of the first women elected to Congress from Alabama in her own right, and the first Black woman to ever serve in the Alabama congressional delegation. And as I said at the start, she is the chairwoman of our wonderful foundation. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome the Honorable Congresswoman Terry Sewell. To all the attendees joining us today, thank you. I'm Congresswoman Terry Sewell, and I proudly represent Alabama's 7th Congressional District and I serve as chair of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. As Nicole mentioned, the CBCF is committed to improving the socioeconomic circumstances of African-Americans and underserved communities in the United States and around the world. As we know, maternal mortality is on the rise in America and it directly and disproportionately affects black women. Globally, an estimated 810 women die each day due to the complications of pregnancy and childbirth, with the Sub-Saharan Africa accounting for almost 66% of the maternal deaths. There are so many factors that contribute to this crisis, including pre-existing conditions, racial bias, lack of resources, and concerns for lack of compassion for African-American women. Without action, the crisis of Black maternal mortality will continue to grow and burden families and local communities. It is time that we address the elephant in the room and find a better approach that involves the patient, providers, and public health policy. With this new approach, we can truly make a global change for African-American women, as well as Black women all around the globe. I am so excited for today's conversation and look forward to seeing you at many more CBCF events in the near future. Thank you again for joining us and thank you to our event sponsors for helping to advance the global black community. Now, I would like to introduce a leader who has dedicated her career to public service as an advocate for Illinois families. 
She is the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus Health Brain Trust and is here today to introduce the moderators for this morning session. Please join me in welcoming my colleague and dear friend, Congresswoman Robin Kelly. Thank you, Congresswoman Sewell. I love my sister's courageous leadership and so delighted by her lovely introduction. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Policy for the People Health Equity Virtual Summit. I am Congresswoman Robin Kelly, and I'm so excited to be with so many providers, patients, and public health practitioners gathered here today to learn how equitable health resources in maternal care and addressing issues in chronic illness can directly impact the Black community. In 2020, the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation launched the Policy for the People Virtual Brain Trust Series to provide critical policy updates on the most pressing issues facing the Black community during the COVID-19 era. You've heard all of my titles today, but I also speak to you today as a mother of two, a stepmother of two, and a grandmother. I have leveraged my position in Congress and drawn from my experience as a mother to mobilize my colleagues to address health inequities, most notably the maternal mortality crisis. For too long, Black Americans, people of color, and low-income individuals have been left behind when it comes to healthcare access, leading to disproportionately higher rates of certain illnesses, maternal mortality, and death. When you hear of women dying from giving birth some before, during, and quite a few after, it's usually from the time of giving birth to one full year after these maternal health issues occur. And we hear about this from obstetricians and gynecologists that say it would save lives if women could see their doctor throughout the postpartum period. Until the maternal mortality issue stops claiming the lives of birthing people, I will continue to remind everyone, as you've already heard, that each year, 810 women die globally each day due to complications of pregnancy and childbirth. Many of these deaths are preventable and they occur often between 43 and 365 days postpartum. While we have seen many advancements in healthcare over the last few decades, women of color and women living in rural communities tend to suffer the most. We must fully pass the Build Back Better Act to bring reliable, affordable healthcare coverage to all Americans, regardless of where they live or what they look like. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today. And I look forward to collaborating with all of you to eliminate the maternal mortality crisis. I would now like to introduce today's first session moderator, Dr. Rahel Nardos. Dr. Nardos was born and raised in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. She has dedicated her life to health equity work, particularly the care of women with childbirth issues and related pelvic floor disorders, both locally and internationally. Dr. Nardos is a Yale School of Medicine graduate that has served in various leadership roles, including head of the Division of Urogynecology at Kaiser Permanente Northwest and Director of Global Health in OBGYN at OHSU. She is also a co-founder and vice chair of Global Perm, a Portland-based NGO that supports local and international sustainable health equity work. And in her current role as the inaugural director of Global Women's Health and associate professor, professor in the Division of Female Pelvic Medicine and Reconstructive Surgery at the University of Minnesota, she is actively involved in advancing women's health globally. Please help me give a warm, warm welcome to this morning's fabulous moderator, Dr. Rahel Nardos. Doctor? Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Representative Kelly. It's a privilege to be in the company of such tireless advocates for women's health. I am delighted to introduce you to our panelists for this session. Um, so our first panelist, Dr. Pandora Hartman, serves as the Chief Nursing and Midwifery Officer of JAPAIGO, a nonprofit organization for international health affiliated with Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Hartman has over 20 years of experience in nursing and midwifery, both in the U.S. and abroad. Welcome 
to this discussion, Dr. Hartman. And our second panelist, Ms. Megan McKenzie, works in patient inclusion and health equity within Genentech's uh, Chief Diversity Office, where she works to ensure greater inclusivity of racially and ethnically representative patients in clinical research. Welcome, Ms. McKenzie. And uh, Rosa Chuenko is the country director for CARE International in Ghana, based in Accra. And CARE is a global health organization that fights poverty and social injustice by empowering women and girls. Ms. Chuenko has been with CARE International for about 17 years and coordinates programs to strengthen civil society responses to health crisis. So welcome to this discussion. Thank and um, I'm gonna get us started by just giving a little overview of um, what's happening uh, in keeping with what uh, our representatives have already discussed so far. So as, as was mentioned, you know, maternal mortality is widely acknowledged as a barometer uh, of overall health of a population and the status of women in society and the functioning of a health system. We know that Sub-Saharan Africa, as previously mentioned, accounts for about 66% of global maternal death. And although developing nations uh, fare much better, the US actually has uh, the highest maternal mortality rate in the developed world. And in fact, even though global maternal mortality rate has been declining, in uh, the past several years, the rate has actually increased in the US and black and American Indian and Alaska native women have three times higher maternal mortality compared to white women. So we have a big problem. So here is my question to the panelists and Dr. Hartman, I would like to start with you. Um, what social, cultural and systemic factors contribute to this global and local disparities from your perspective? Thank you so much, Dr. Nardo. Um, from my perspective, one of the continuing contribution factors I think is shown in my career, whereas we look at midwifery, as we know, as one of the global solutions to impacting maternal mortality. In fact, when we look at our very U.S. taxpaying dollars. We contribute a lot of money to maternal newborn health programs globally and have had a strong history of, you know, millions of dollars of funding in doing so. And we contribute to midwives. Yet as a black midwife in America, we are still struggling with numbers of six to eight percent. And 25 years into this career, our numbers are still not increasing significantly enough to provide as well, not just the midwifery care, which is centered in normal physiology, but also that racially concordant care and that culturally sensitive care that we also know is a huge, huge impact on the factors and contributors. And I mean, we're doing some really good things when I look at what's happening with the Momni bus and all of these things that are beginning to get at the factors. However, just educating more of us is not enough in the theoretical because there's still a significant barrier in terms of accessing clinical practice sites. So, you know, looking at just more money for education or the HBCUs isn't enough when not a week goes by where I'm not getting a call from a women's health nurse practitioner or a midwife asking for clinical practice sites because we're blocked from accessing hospitals and you know all the other myriad of factors that detract from a competent workforce. So the concordant care, there's a lot of pieces to it that we really need to use what we know works, you know, what we've applied in other locales that that do work. Uh, so that's just one thought. I got lots of thoughts on, on the why, but I will stick to the provider piece. And I will say for my OBGYN colleagues out there, this same challenge with our numbers not rising in terms of training remains as true for my OBGYN colleagues. And then if I go further into the retention piece where everyone's getting out of the profession really fast, you know, I've been told a lot recently, they don't make them like you anymore to last with OBGYNs, what, seven years and they're out. With midwives, we're finding the same thing. So we got a lot of other factors uh, to address as well. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. And I will tell you as a provider myself, as a clinician, 
just this week, I had a patient who came to see me and who was so happy to know that I looked like her when when I walked in. And you can see the surprise on her face and her, um, you know, openness uh, to to engage with me. Uh, so I think you know having more providers who look like their patients is a big part of it too, just like you mentioned. Um, Ms. Twenko, do you want to add to that? Yes, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nados. Um, I, I, uh, the, the identification with your provider resonates. Um, however, you would think in Sub-Saharan Africa, where it's mostly Black providers serving uh, Black women, uh, uh, the situation would be a lot better than we experience. However, there are so many social, deep-rooted cultural and traditional practices that make it so much more difficult for women in sub-Saharan Africa, parts of Asia, the Middle East, to access services when those services are available and of acceptable quality. So there's a whole systemic issue about the availability of personnel, of a, qualified workforce, as well as the service as even the consumables in health centers in our context. However, we are talking about gender inequality as one of the main drivers of maternal mort mortality. And it doesn't just start with women, young or adult women. It starts with young children, young girls, adolescent girls. And we see that um, through practices such as um, child, early or forced marriage, or female genital uh, mutilation, which is prevalent in many settings in the developing world, these are the factors that fuel um, the, the risk for women every time a woman or a child has to deliver a baby. And um, the treatment of women in, the, in, the, in some of our maternity settings, in clinical settings, I come from a family of physicians, so I had exposure, didn't follow my parents in that path. But um, sometimes the incidents you witness in hospitals of a woman who is having a difficult delivery are quite shocking and um, demotivating. And what I, one of the big questions we have to answer as to why women, even when the health centers are, are available and accessible, do not go for um, for um, delivery in health centers. Um, we are uh, talking about the perception of what a child is in our settings. When uh, a young girl hits puberty, has her, her first period, is she ready for marriage? Does that transition her into a potential mother? In some of our uh, settings, that still remains a much a reality in 2022. And our attention to that we see um, some of that reflected in the in the in the statistics you've seen in the United States as well among uh, uh, black and um, uh, people of color and the uh, rising mat uh, 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 maternal mortality numbers and I think it, one of the other big areas globally of concern and uh, and with all of us feeling the pressure, especially after COVID, of where are the health workers with people leaving the sector in droves. In Africa, we have been dealing with the, what we call the brain drain of talent, leaving the continent and seeking better, justifiably so, better opportunities elsewhere. So in addition to uh, what you're facing, there's also that mobility in the health sector that leaves us even weaker uh, when it comes to addressing this problem. As uh, with Dr. Hartman, there's so much more we could share about the, the experience on the ground, but I would hand it over back to you, Dr. Nadus. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ms. Trenko. And, you know, as you're speaking, I was uh, also thinking how, first off, you know, I'm involved in both global and local health, right? Um, I actually was just in Botswana and Ethiopia just two weeks ago taking care of patients. And then I'm here this week taking care of patients in Minnesota. And what is really fascinating, uh, the cultural uh, practices that you mentioned, for example, female genital cutting and its impact on women's health, uh, that that travels with you, even when you actually migrate and come to countries like the US. You know, I had a patient just yesterday 
who uh, had gone through 18 procedures to fix the problems created by FGC. And I was one of the surgeons involved yesterday and it has devastated her life and her ability to bear children. So I think there's a lot of uh, connection between what happens globally and what happens locally as well. Uh, there's so much you brought up in this discussion and I hope we can dig deeper and further in the panel. Ms. McKenzie, I know you come from a clinical research perspective. Do you have something to add to, to this conversation? I do. Thank you so much. I absolutely agree. Diversity in the workforce is very much needed. Every healthcare company, uh, we, saw, we saw a note from Novartis, needs to be giving money toward diversity in the workforce. We have a kindergarten through careers program to increase the number of students with color in STEM. But I, I would say um, you know, the rest of the world, while rates, mortali uh, mom mortality is going down and they're rising in the US, there are a lot of hypertension disorders in the US that are rising and preeclampsia is one of them. And uh, as it's described to me, preeclampsia is in a normal um, placenta. It's like having a great highway of vasculature, but more like a windy, windy road in preeclampsia. And those rates are going up in the US due to increasing rates of hypertension, um, obesity. Personally, my, my sister has lost her baby in late trimester due to di diabetes. She's lost two. Uh, unfortunately, I also had a, a premature birth. Um, this is a problem with um, access. I, I heard our panelists say that as well. We have geographic deserts in the US that are like developing countries. And it shouldn't, you know, based on where you live or the color of your skin, it should not matter. You should all be getting equal treatment. And our healthcare access is not sufficient. We have our uninsured, our underinsured, you mentioned rural health. Um, consistent care is really important for women. So if you don't have regular access to a specialist or an OB and you live really far away from them and you might be leaning in on emergency room visits, physicians who are not familiar with how to, how to deal with subtle symptoms of preeclampsia, they can get missed. And what we, we need to really empower women to push like if something feels different. Some of the symptoms of preeclampsia are very similar to normal pregnancy, swelling, headache, fatigue, uh, tire, tiredness and a, and a swollen belly. <laughs> but if it feels different, we need to empower patients and we need to better train healthcare professionals to pick up on those subtle nuances and consistency of care is really, really important. Until we fix the insurance problem in this country, we're gonna have a problem with access. So that's that's a big one. Also, I will say it, racism in America, racism in healthcare prof 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 providers. Um, Commonwealth Fund did a survey and found that one out of four Latino and one out of four black adults feel discriminated against in clinic. So we need to take a good look at ourselves and do some self-analysis, improve cultural competency, um, do healthcare innovation funds that Genentech were looking at racism and culture and, and co-creating educational material on racism and unconscious bias in the clinics with our sites, who, who many who see the problem and some who don't think they're part of the problem. So we need to wake up and shake up um, our healthcare practices. Uh, but I absolutely agree with you. We have a dearth um, of nursing professionals, midwives. We're not fully supporting um, our, our moms, our, our mother full nation. We, we need to do a lot better. Thank you, Ms. McKenzie. I was actually really glad you brought the issue of racism because my next question was going to transition to that. Um, you know, regardless of socioeconomic status, education level and income even, there's still disparities in maternal outcome uh, due to entrenched systemic um, factors uh, that continue to disadvantage black and brown women. Um, so I know you kind of started on this and I was gonna ask you actually as a first person on this, uh, I know your work uh, focuses on developing strategies to drive greater inclusion uh, of racially and ethnically diverse uh, representative patient populations in clinical research and to advance equity. So um, how, do you, how do you do that? How do you address some of the systemic barriers in your own work environment? Yeah, we um, so that is that is where I work in patient inclusion, improving diversity in our clinical trials, and even before a novel potential novel medication. First of all, medications being created are only reaching eight percent of patients worldwide. Period. We have a problem with access worldwide, um, but largely industry has been working in 
in bringing patients into to trials that are of European ancestry. Mm -hmm. That's a problem because that means we're understanding efficacy and safety of drugs in mostly white people. We have to include our black and brown communities in research. And this is a problem because of mistrust, right? We have historical gross examples of things that research has done in the past, like Tuskegee trials with black men not giving pen penicillin uh, for syphilis and Henrietta Lacks with, with um, using her cells without consent. Those atrocities that cannot be replicated and we have safeguards in place for that now. So part of my work is working with sites who are doing very well reaching their communities of color and understanding what is the, what are those cultural competencies and best practices that we need to be building across all of our sites and how are sites um, leaning in, helping with their communities and, and working with communities and getting into the communities. Sites who are very successful are already in their communities. They have lay navigators who are, who are helping with community overall health. And, you know, we do a lot in oncology, but we also do have a lot of diagnostics in um, prenatal so some of these these lay navigators and we're starting to put this into our, our work where we help fund the patient navigators in our studies they help with every aspect so um i love and i'll, I'll leave it because i know we need to, to to give up to other panelists but one of the successes in women's health is how we do multiple care points through obese right we do testing for breast cancer cervical cancer endometrial cancer women's health and um, col even colon cancer, right? So if we can get more women to obese, we can get them earlier diagnosed and knowledge is power. So part of my work is education. Part of my work is working with sites who are doing very well reaching their communities. And part of my work is bridging uh, liaison work with government affairs and policy change. Fantastic. Long answer. No, that's wonderful. That's great. And of course, that kind of it, work requires intentionality and also the willingness to be patient and put patients first because uh, sometimes, you know, of course, uh, the market, um, the inclination, especially uh, with, um, uh, you know, industry or even academia to get research done fast can can also bias us towards uh, leaving out the people whose voices need to be heard. So I'm glad that you, you mentioned those things. I was going to turn to Dr. Hardman next, you know, nurses and midwives are at the front line serving our communities and seeing how systems can fail them and their healthcare teams despite their best efforts. How does um, your work attempt to address this? Thank you. Well, a lot of the work I do, I'm roughly 70% in the global arena under JAPIGO and 30% in the local arena. And additionally, I serve service on the board of the International Confederation of Midwives, um, representing elected for North Americas and the Caribbean. So we have a broad range of my looking at systems. You know, what are the systems? What are the issues and the enabling environment? The State of the World's Midwifery Report 2021 is really calling for us to look at the stratagems of decent work and decent pay and what those conditions can look like for women, in particular, if you're at risk of rape, you know, because you're working a night facility or we can switch it to the harassment issues or a myriad of issues because we know that there is that lack you know, of providers, and why would you stay when you haven't been paid? So we do a lot of intentional work looking into the system. So we tend to have long-term partnerships, you know, in countries and in both of my work streams are saying, and getting to know the local systems. You know, we focus most on the 25 high priority countries within USAID and say, what is the systems level problems that are addressing this and getting to know people? I mean, it's also interesting as well, because two or three months ago, I had the first time in my career, I actually wanted to quit and leave. It's amazing that we're doing this today on Nurses Day, you know, because of staffing issues. I thought I said to the staff, oh, my God, I'm back in Africa. I'm right back in Africa. I called for help for 20 minutes for what I knew was going to be an emergency case for an mm. estimated 11 pound baby. And nobody came. Mm. Panic attack. And I made a pretty stern stuff, you know, being out there in the field with no electricity, you know, sub nobody came in America, in a metropolitan area. And nobody came because there was nobody. Because, and then I heard them calling for nurses. Please, we'll offer you triple pay. 
everybody was like, we're not coming. We're not coming. So for me, it was a weird merging of my two worlds where the environment is not supporting anyone to stay within the care professions. And we know without the caregivers, there's going to be poor care. Uh, so we got to really look deep. You know, I was with the Frontline Healthcare Workers Coalition the other day, and I said, it. it's not a quick fix. This is not a quick fix. And what I'm also finding is that on both sides of the globe in my work, there's a lack of willingness to undo the ugly, to really get into the issues of the financing behind what's driving some of our well, many of our systemic failures, what's going on with the egos, what's going on with the lobbies. We got to uncover the ugly. You know, this also was International Day of the Midwives last Thursday as well on the 5th. And we were talking, some of us saying, we feel like there's just been a lot of mumbo jumbo going on. Everyone's saying the right words, but to really get in, it's going to take time. It's going to break resources. It's going to take people who are willing to break down and cry sometimes. To yes. really, that's really not what I'm seeing. That's yes. okay. I'll 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 stop because I'm gonna roll here. There, this is <laughs> when it comes to the system. I mean, uh, it's overwhelming because I, I totally agree with you. I think the mambo jumbo and the ugly, exactly as you say it, because it's kind of used. Uh, it, it kind of um, prevents us from seeing what the real issues are. And we're kind of banging our heads against a wall, uh, but it's not openly discussed. And, and it's not like we're told this is the priority uh, and so we can't make this happen. And so I think uncovering that is going to require a lot of work and a lot of uh, honest conversation and uh, with all, all uh, responsible parties. Uh, and Ms. Trenko, you know, you play a leadership role at a global organization that fights poverty and social justice, you know, both symptoms of a biased system that in some ways was designed to maintain inequities, I would say. Um, how do you go about challenging the status quo in, in your work? Yeah, thank you. I, I think that connection sometimes gets lost when we talk about race, but we in the rest of the world, especially in Saharan Africa, we are still dealing with the legacies of colonization and slavery. And um, a lot of our practices and systems were built on a colonial model that was designed to reinforce the separation, the discrimination, the, the oppression, and we continue to deal with that today. Case in point, COVID-19 and the, 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 the refusal or the resistance to transferring the knowledge and the technology to get vaccines to the people, including the frontline health workers in communities and in clinical settings who are the ones who are most impacted by the crisis as it happened. That continues to perpetuate uh, the injustice of racism, of slavery, and of colonialism. And we are seeing the same impact that you're experiencing in the United States at what Dr. Hartman was um, describing, where um, basically the women are fed up. They're fed up of trying on a daily basis to try to change a system that is just seems fixed against them. So how do we address that as care? Um, one of our recent work around the impact of um, gender in the COVID response globally focus on female frontline health workers. And one of the ways we want we are addressing that in settings where we do not have a lot of resources is to get the community involved. First, we have to work on the women's agency, voice, ability to lead the change. We have to get the communities to understand why it is so critical to address the issues of maternal mortality and as well health equity in general in their communities. And we are also working on getting men and boys involved as soon as possible in the conversation and in leading the change. We recognize that in our systems, we face many challenges apart from the systemic. We also have issues of corruption. We have issues of fraud. We have all the other uh, social ills that contribute and perpetuate the, the situation. So get our citizens to find their voice and their ability to act. And 
in places like Malawi, where I lived for five and a half years, um, one of the things you see that changing is when communities are able not just to identify the problem, but to take action to fix it. And in settings which we would normally consider um, um, resource poor, not having the finances, they were able to mobilize the resources and the materials to, uh, to resolve the problem of lack of um, guardian care for women who have to travel hundreds of miles to come to access um, uh, maternal health care. And in this work, we actually worked with Japaigo for in a, in a five year activity. And that was one of the most powerful uh, examples of community action. And I yeah. think it is as applicable in sub-Saharan Africa as it is applicable in the United States these days. The, uh, we have to take ownership and we have to get our leaders to listen and to act. And if they don't, we change. I think that's how we, we are making a difference. Oh, so well said, so well said. And I can't, I can't uh, say enough about the power of, first off, uh, communities and women and girls, they are our assets, actually. Mm -hmm. They're, they know what's right for them yeah. and empowering them to have a voice and um, to really kind of energize from the ground up is one of the strategies to really dismantle systemic biases because, you know, you can't just be waiting for the system to come to your side. You kind of yes. have to. Um, thank you for saying that. Um, and of course, you know, in the real world, obviously, poverty is a real thing. And with all best intentions, even with community empowerment, that can really make it very difficult for women and girls. Women earning low wages have especially challenging experience with maternal outcomes due to lack of access to reproductive care and quality of care received. And, um, you know, this has actually come glaringly obvious uh, in the last week as we watch how restriction to uh, abortion care in some cases access to long-term contraception may disproportionately affect poor women who are likely to be predominantly black and brown. Mm -hmm. uh, the 2021 Build Back Better Act includes several provisions to improve black maternal health including funding local entities to address social determinants of maternal health uh, growing uh, the, perin uh, the perinatal health, uh, health workforce and also managing the impact of mental health and climate change on maternal health, which is becoming more and more important. Um, the act was passed by the House, but uh, not made it through the Senate. From a, a global perspective, you know, access to funds is also limited when it comes to building health systems and addressing root causes of disparities. Um, so I'm going to start with you, Dr. Hartman. Um, what programs and community resources can low-income earning women engage with to bridge this gap in the interim? And uh, what advice would you offer practitioners um, working in the space? If you can briefly um, describe that. I believe we have about 10 more minutes left. So um, thank you for um, weighing in on this. Thank you. Um, resources, if I'm recalling the question right, resources for the healthcare care and community based resources. Right. I think both of them, we just really need to see about our circles of support, um, really finding our allies who can speak for us. And I think this is applies to both both pieces and looking for allies, I would say, in unusual places it was the word you know when we talk about empowering the healthcare workers sometimes i struggle with that because on top of an already burdened system we're also saying to the health workers now you got to go out and fix this or now you need more training so when you're mm -hmm. drowning and struggling to prov to provide and to show up every day in systems where you're underpaid and overworked and yes that's just even the same in in the US where wages in some you know southern states have not gone up bringing the circles of support in you know while also balancing that the media image of the hero or the angel i think COVID also did a lot of damage because who wants to be a self-sacrifice right you know on the front lines of that so where do the providers find gentle support when they are abused where do the community organizations find that support? Because as I'm watching the processes of localization, localization reporting structures are still rooted in colonial structures. 
that say this margin, this font, this time, this whatever. So a lot of the local organizations who we could tap into are tapping out because it's mm -hmm. just too much for the smaller amounts of funding. So again, this takes creative work. I need the people who have had the good stories to come on board for us as well, because I do believe everybody listening can do something to help in this. So, you know, identify yourself to the community based organizations, to your provider support organizations. We all need the help. Yes. You know, everybody can show up for this issue and do something. And I fear sometimes we talk so much about the lack that we have created a culture of learned helplessness from the community and the caregivers. Yeah. Wow. So insightful. Um, Ms. McKenzie, would you like to add from your perspective on this? I, I wholeheartedly agree. It's not any one profession that's going to solve the healthcare crisis in America. We have this, this, uh, I'll quote my, my, my big boss, Quita Highsmith. Um, she reports directly to the CEO of three B's, beauty salon, barbershop, bishop. So how can we go to the community, help train on basic health, ensure that we have health? And we've seen this in COVID, right? We've seen amazing success with, um, in pre-COVID as well, faith-based organizations that have health embedded. They have health ministry embedded. So go to your churches. There are a few places that my, my physicians who work in maternal health tell me, March for Moms is a great place, Birth, Birth Equity Caucus, Preeclampsia Foundation. So you could Google Preeclampsia Foundation and get educational information. So patients are empowered. So it may be pre-pregnancy or during pregnancy, you can start to educate yourself. And and I, I'm with you on the empowered voice. I mean, women are not listened to. Uh, they um, I've got some stats here that are 50% more likely to receive an incorrect diagnosis after having a heart attack. That's women. Uh, 16 Wait 16 minutes longer in an emergency room than men. Mm -hmm. uh, men are more likely to get personalized care. And 65% of women with chronic pain feel physicians fail to take their pain seriously. And we know in particular in our African-American community, pain relief is a problem. People are not being treated equally. So I would say empower yourself. We are full of a motherful nation. We're so busy taking care of our families, healthcare decisions for others. We don't always take care of ourselves. Be as forceful for yourself as you would for your child. Like mm -hmm. say, hey, wait a minute, something's not right. And if that professional's, you know, not listening, I'm, I'm thinking here about unconscious bias. That if that person's not listening to you, find someone else. But I would lean into those three Bs: your community efforts with ministry, barbershop, beauty salon. We are finding very, very strong health advocates that are there. Yeah, I I love that and. Um, you know, as you're talking, it reminds me of this initiative that we're looking at right now, where one of the things I notice when I take care of my patients uh, from immigrant and refugee background is they bring their young girls to the visit because they speak English and they have grown up in this country and can be cultural brokers for their families. And one of the things that we're looking at right now uh, through a community uh, participatory action research is actually to engage the youth and their parents in a conversation about how that's going and what what uh, what are the difficulties they have in communicating with their own parents and also with the health system and how can we make that better in terms of health literacy, leadership advocacy, because like I said before, I feel like the young people are our future and how, how do we change this narrative by focusing on the young people. So we can mm -hmm. talk for hours about that, but I want to give Ms. Chuenko, a little uh, chance to comment on if you have anything to add to this. Yes, I, I do totally agree about, you know, um, I, I would hesitate to use the word empower because that in, implies you're bringing the power to them, but it's kind of to help to give space for, um, for women to express that power and to find, uh, to, ex, um, to elevate their voices and be heard. Um, but there's still a lot of work we need to do about um, the, the whole issue around perception. How are women and girls perceived in their communities? Because that translates into how a teacher treats a female um, pupil, how uh, a young girl trying to access youth-friendly um, um, sexual health reproductive services is treated by the provider. 
I did an exercise once with my team and we were doing a value clarification exercise. And I said, tell me all the words you can hear in your community about how we refer to adolescent girls, to the young girl, 15 year old. And it was some of the stuff was, it's not things I would want to repeat in public, but this was real. And, um, and now imagine the, the young girl who was pregnant and dropped out of school and how being referred to as used goods, easy prey, and that shapes her experience going forward. And I think for us in this space, as um, Dr. Hartman was saying about, you know, passing on the empowerment baton to the person who is most impacted by it, we should be ready to accept the risk that the change we want to happen entails for the people who we want to lead the change. Um, asking a woman in some of our communities or a young girl to step up and speak about these issues in certain settings is risky. And much as we may provide the training and everything. So we should be able to stand with them at every step of the way and share that risk. And I also think one area where we undervalue our, uh, our community systems and the talent and the knowledge and the indigenous knowledge in our communities. Because before we came to this point, that we were able to find solutions to our problems uh, as we learned and we shared that information. And when we are sometimes come with our programs, we forget to tap into that richness and, and really make that. And that usually is the problem we have with sustaining the change we want to, to, to make happen. Um, that's beautiful. And actually, you know, you touched on a lot of the things uh, I was going to bring up um, in the further conversation. We only have a couple of minutes, so I'm going to have to kind of wrap it up here. Sadly, I want to talk to you for a long time. Um, but I do want to say that, um, you know, that empowerment piece that, you know, it's a good place to end this conversation, but also the fact that we need to stand with our patients. Um, like you said, they're very vulnerable. We need to invest in the future generation to empower them with those with that information. Um, you know, there are there's a very well known global health, um, maternal health, uh, and other actually you know uh, community engagement work where they created uh, accompaniment models. Uh, I know Partners in Health has done a lot of that work in Haiti uh, under Dr. Paul Farmer's leadership where they have mm -hmm. women accompanying other women. Uh, you know, is there a, such a model with healthcare professionals as well accompanying patients? Um, uh, you know, so there are a lot of really interesting models we can explore. Um, I, I want to just end by saying, you know, there's a saying in Ethiopia, uh, it says, um, when spider webs unite, they can tie up a lion. And what they mean is, you know, we need the collective voices of and the collective wisdom of communities, including the communities themselves. They need to be front and center in the work that we do. I'm learning a lot right now in my community participatory reaction research uh, work with our community researchers and how that's done well, how you build trust with communities and how do you involve them from every step of the way of any kind of programming or research or anything you hope to introduce and, and make sure that they have ownership of the work that's happening for longer sustainability. So, um, you know, I, I would love uh, for us to build a world where every girl and women have um, uh, access to uh, quality healthcare so she can, uh, she can realize her full potential no matter what the lottery of her birth. Uh, and uh, with that, thank you so much for being here and for your voices. And I hope we do this again. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, everybody. I'm Lauren Underwood, and I have the honor of representing Illinois' 14th Congressional District. I would like to thank the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation for hosting this important conversation. And I'd like to especially acknowledge my colleagues Representative Robin Kelly, Joyce Beatty, and Terry Sewell, and thank them for their leadership on the urgent issue of maternal health. 
as a co-founder and co-chair of the Black Maternal Health Caucus alongside Congresswoman Alma Adams, I join you in the mission to eliminate preventable maternal mortality and advance birth equity for families across the United States and around the world. Globally, more than 800 people die every day from pregnancy-related complications. While that number has declined in recent decades, it is still shamefully high. And although maternal deaths are falling worldwide, the U.S. pregnancy-related mortality rate is rising, and this unacceptable trend is driven by stark racial and ethnic disparities. The maternal mortality rate for Black and Native Americans is two to four times higher than the rate for white Americans and Hispanic and AAPI people also experience elevated rates of maternal mortality and morbidity. The pandemic has only worsened these trends. Pregnant people with COVID-19 are more likely to experience severe illness from the virus, and they're more likely to experience adverse birth outcomes. That's why it's so essential for people who are pregnant or planning to become pregnant to get the COVID-19 vaccine. And it's also why we need bold evidence-based policy action to save moms in the United States and around the world during this pandemic and beyond. Last year, I introduced a sweeping package of 12 bills to address our nation's maternal mortality crisis, the Black Maternal Health Mommy Bus Act, which builds on existing legislation to comprehensively address every driver of maternal mortality, morbidity, and disparities in America. The legislation includes investments to grow and diversify the perinatal workforce, improve data collection, fund community-based organizations, expand access to housing, nutrition, and healthy environments during and after pregnancy, and support moms with mental health conditions and substance use disorders. I was proud to introduce the Mommy Bus with then-Senator, now Vice President Kamala Harris in 2020, and I am thrilled to be partnering with her now to move these priorities forward. And over the past year, we've seen historic progress with the first Mommy Bus bill signed into law, another passing the House with unanimous bipartisan support, and nearly $1 billion in additional maternal health investments included in the government funding legislation that was enacted in March of 2022. But there's still more work to do, both at home and abroad. As a member of the House Appropriations Committee, I have prioritized funding for global maternal and child health programs through USAID which mobilize individuals, governments, and health facilities to advance quality, respectful, accessible care during pregnancy, throughout labor and delivery, and for the entire postpartum period. I look forward to working with my colleagues in Congress and all of you to get these critical investments passed and signed into law. Families are counting on it, and we have no time to waste. Thank you for everything you're doing to elevate this important issue. I look forward to the day I can be with you in person, but until then, Take good care of yourself. Thank you, Representative Underwood. Mothers, mothers play such a vital role in society, raising, rearing, and providing some of the most inherent caregiving to future generations. Thank you to all of our panelists and Dr. Rahel Nardos for leading such an impactful discussion on how we can reduce preventable harm and create health systems that serve mothers equitably. Thank you all who have attended online and engaged in this discussion with us. We invite you to join the networking rooms following this session where we will continue the conversation and discuss action steps we can take as a community. Thank you Chairwoman Sewell, Congresswoman Kelly and Underwoman Underwood for your leadership and participation. We appreciate your support. And to our sponsors, Novartis, Genentech, Amgen, League of Women Voters, and Signify Health, we appreciate your partnership. Lastly, before we conclude this session, we want to remind you of how you can stay in touch with us. We want to hear from you. Please scan the QR code to complete a survey about today's event. Your insight helps us meet your needs for future events. Follow us on social media through Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. It's an easy way to stay connected to the CBCF. Spread the word and save the date for our next event, the 2022 Scholarship Classic, an amazing opportunity to golf, network, spend time with our CBC members and raise money for a great cause, our students. Thank you all for joining us today and we hope to see you in the networking rooms and again this afternoon for session two on heart disease at 2 p.m. Thank you.